what an honor to be here today. I know everyone says that, but for me, it really does feel very special to be able to speak to everybody um, right now. I'm an entrepreneur, uh, co-founder of COGX, and as you said, um, that puts me in a very different position. I'm the author of How to Talk to Robots as well, having uh, the pleasure of being the chair of the government's AI council. And so I might not be your typical person that you would invite to give a Turing lecture. I'm usually encouraging others to give lectures, but I'm glad that you all convinced me because I'm here uh, with a passion for the possible impacts of AI. As an entrepreneur, I have a front row seat to its developments and a sense of responsibility for making sure that the AI ecosystem together doesn't squander this opportunity or worse, exasperate existing inequalities. Instead, I hope that AI can play a part in addressing the world's greatest challenges and we can hold ourselves to the higher standards. As you all know, the opportunities AI present to make the world a better place are endless to the risks, but the risks associated are also unending. So, I'm here and really with all of you working to do everything in my power to point at where the cracks are to ensure some light can get in. As Amanda Gorman said in her poem at the Biden inauguration, I think we all listen to with tears. There's always light if we're brave enough to see it and brave enough to be it. And I believe that people are that light. And so today I want to talk to you about three things. Firstly, as Adrian said, my journey to this point in the hope that it will give you a feel for where my energy comes from and why I'm on the hunt for these cracks and where things are broken. The AI Council will be the second thing. And I want to talk about the 16 recommendations that we've made because I ultimately am here to get your feedback, your light, your insights to understand what suggestions you have to support the government strategy work. And thirdly, some thoughts based on the book I wrote, How to Talk to Robots, because I want to leave you with some thoughts of maybe where there are other cracks that need filling. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Adrian Smith, Adrian Weller, everyone at the Turi, Jesse Wand, and, the, and inviting me here today. I'm just gutted I can't see you all. So let's start with my journey. Growing up, here's me and my brother, I played Game Boy incessantly. Yoshi's Dream World, Mario Kart races, Tekken, I love the thrill of the win. Both my parents were in fashion, and yet we still sat and watched Robot Wars together with glee. In 1995, when I was 10, they bought me an Acorn computer. I'd spent hours absorbed in Microsoft Paint, creating personalized desktop backgrounds for friends and family. And of course, I charged them. At school, the door to the internet was asked Jeeves, a British butler who fronted the search engine and my guide to Word, Excel, and was clippy. Microsoft's very helpful paperclip mascot. I remember having a Tamagotchi that was neither boy nor girl. And all of this is just to say that I was happily unaware of the notion that gender would even play a role in technology. It was not a male or a female thing for me. It was my thing. However, cut forward to a few years later and during I, uh, GCSE IT, I was really really rather bored. We were being shown how to run a doctor's reception and we're using mail merge to access patients' data and send emails. And I was just not inspired. I often wonder, and never blaming my teachers, but I do wonder, what if my teacher had explained to me that tech could help predict which of those patients might need life-saving treatment? Maybe I would have gone on to study science. Instead, I followed in the footsteps of my grandpa and I set about joining the advertising world. I was fascinated by those clever people behind the slogans that captivated mine and my friends' impressionable minds. And at that point, I was enamored and not yet fearful of that power. But before university, I was working in a pub when a brand new fully computerized till system was installed. The manager decided to train his mates, all the men, which meant that they became faster and so were assigned more shifts behind the bar. The women and I ended up waiting the tables. and I didn't stop to think about whether that, that division of labor was fair. I thought computer stuff just wasn't for me. Uh, and I think I just accepted that the guys would do the tills. But the consequence of this mindset meant I inadvertently accepted lower pay, which has earned less than bar staff, and I ended up hating the job I'd come to love. What on earth had happened to me in those interim teenage years? I still don't know. Um, what point had it become the norm for the world of computers to be a male one? So by the time I arrived at university to study advertising, new developments of the web had, had set the world alight, really. There were a new way of communicating with each other. 
I remember waiting for my university email to grant me access to the newly launched The Facebook, uh, which I think nicely places me in the timeline as to some of you being a little old and some of you being incredibly young. And, the, you know, but ultimately the nature of communication was changing and my chosen route into advertising just felt really old and outdated. And I fell in love with the web. Over the course of those years, I chose modules at university that would enable me to refine my relationship with computers. It included how to code. And sadly, I found that my dyslexia held me back. I was quite honestly pretty hopeless. But my real aha moment came was when I was introduced to Squarespace, a tool that meant I didn't have to write the code in order to create a web page and reach people. There were companies and products being released every day that meant people like me who didn't get on with coding could still benefit hugely from its power. So in 2018, on my hunt to either start a business or work for a startup, I met Charlie Muirhead, the CEO and founder of T5M, a new style of digital studio that produced online video content with celebrities. I joined as an intern, learning how to add words and codes to propel each video to the top ranks of YouTube and then distribute them across the internet. When I was promoted to managing a team of other recent grads, we soon realized that the more laborious mechanical aspects of our job had to become automated for full efficiency and to avoid us just going mad with boredom. And this is the moment I got to work directly with the engineering teams and I finally felt at home. I would draw these enthusiastic schematics, praying they'd be able to translate them into software and ultimately they were able. So during this time, the product part of the business had some Great success, but our part human, part software team, we were truly flying. The business pivoted and we concentrated solely on building the tech to enable us to distribute other people's videos even faster. Seeing online those views rack up was everything to me. I was totally hooked. How could we get more views and faster? This company grew, uh, this company, which has now been uh, rene renamed as Rightster, grew to 250 people across 12 countries. And I was later recognized as the co-founder of what was then the largest online video distribution company outside of America. We'd live streamed things like Kate and William's Wedding, 2000 fashion shows, the Brit Awards, and many other high profile events. But it all felt so incredibly manual. We had to work with thousands of websites in order to get millions of views. And even with our awesome 70 strong tech team, I believe there had to be a way to escape this endless copying and pasting of the code that transferred the video from the cloud to the online websites. And this is when I first heard about data science, machine learning, and eventually AI. I thought it was a miracle. Honestly, the sleepless nights could be a thing of the past. I was planning for the machines to just take over. But of course, it really wasn't that simple. Charlie Muirhead, who was still the CEO and founder of the business, he sent me on a mission to investigate. And I spent an entire year and a significant amount of the company's money and my colleagues' patience trying to harness this new technology. The dream was to use AI to get the right video to the right person at exactly the right time in order to get them to do exactly what our clients wanted, to click on the link. We needed this to be done automatically without having to manually guess which sites would embed the video or which video to serve to which user. And AI was to predict it. But frustratingly, as some of you can imagine, we didn't achieve the necessary financial results fast enough. And people just lost faith. Back then, there were in a few companies who knew how to build these AI systems, and it was nigh on impossible for a layperson to navigate. A wild west, some might say. And ultimately, I learned the hard way that AI wasn't magic, and it would take a lot more than passion for it to work. This experience shaped our next big leap. After Wrightster went public and acquired other small businesses in the field, it was time for us to leave. We decided to de dedicate our time to understanding AI and learning what it meant for other companies. Charlie and I were lucky to be in London and surrounded by some of the best universities in the world. We hosted dinner for Big Brains. Here you can see the amazing room and chowdhury at our early dinner and debated the hot topics of the day. Our guides were John Shaw Taylor, John Crowcroft, also in the picture, Anthony Finkelstein and Jane Butler which for those of you who know all of those amazing people might understand me a little bit better now. It was clear that AI was a paradigm shift. This was gonna change the whole of society, not just our business. Others, and many of you will have understood this revelation a lot earlier than me, but for me, it was 2016 and I've not looked back. We wrote reports for the Mayor of London Lots office where we analyzed the AI ecosystem in order to help develop policy to encourage more companies to set up in the city. 
and did everything we could to demystify the tech for businesses and catalyze more adoption. I laugh looking back, but I used to call ourselves the Ghostbusters of AI. COGX now employs over 50 people and provides a platform that brings you thought leadership across hundreds of partners and soon thousands in one place. Each year, as Adrian said, we hold a festival in London called COGX, where 30,000 visitors from industry, government, civil society and academia come together to discuss how to get the next 10 years right. And I hope you can join us June 14 to 16, where we really want to be physical as safely as we possibly can be, but of course we will still be online virtually. Last June, we had over 40,000 people logging in and really there is no limit to how many people can join us. Ooh, it's fair to say that I threw myself head first into the world of AI. I tried to talk to every machine going. I was overly optimistic to say the least. But things began to shift when I realized that AI techniques would make existing inequalities even starker. And the genius of the fact that AI could personalize down to the individual also made the people and the companies developing AI incredibly powerful and potentially dangerous. I started to read widely and deeply on the topic and I woke up to the reality that AI could potentially have serious negative effects for women, people, black, Asian, ethnic minorities, and in fact could bias against anyone from any protected characteristic. Weapons of Mass Destruction by Cathy O'Neill became my North Star, and I was hungry to get to the root of the problem. I was quite shocked at how naive I'd been, to be honest, and so set about pointing out this crack and shining a light on the people who had some answers to ensure others, like me, weren't so naive in the future. Thanks to the encouragement from my amazing mentors like Dame Wendy Hall, who actually wrote Where Have All the Women Gone back in 1987, I started to gather women and host events called Why Women in AI. This is an awesome illustration from Jess Wade from one of the first ones. I was on this mission to understand the scale and depth of the challenge and point out why we needed to change. At the first event, the Turing's very own Maxine McIntosh was joined by Anne-Marie Mathedon and Joanna Bryson to explain the risks associated with leaving women and people of color out of the research. The urgency was real. This fight became like a lightning rod in the UK, galvanizing a community of people who wanted to work internationally and see this crack fixed. And while all of this was going on, my journey into AI policy also started, similarly with just a desire to help. In 2017, when as part of the industrial strategy, the UK government commissioned an independent review into AI. I signed myself up for all the workshops I could attend. I set about being a foghorn for the issues my community asked me to champion. My mission being to ensure that more voices were heard. As you all probably know, based on Dame Wendy Hall and Jerome Pacenti's review, the government announced a billion pound AI sector deal and set up three bodies. Firstly, the Office of AI was created. This is a team of civil servants driving the sector deal and overseeing implementation of AI and the data grand challenge, helmed by the brilliant Sana Karagani. And the second was the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, an independent advisory body set to investigate and advise how we maximize the benefits of AI and data-driven technologies ethically. And finally, the AI Council, of which you all know, I am the chair. The council is made up of 22 of the UK's leading thinkers, from industry, academia and civil society, who are willing and able to support the government in offering their independent expert advice, as well as connecting to the wider community. In June 2020, the council agreed we needed to set out our collective vision to the government on how AI should develop in the UK. And so began the process of writing our own AI roadmap. A where to play, not a how to play for government. The roadmap is not a strategy, nor is it an instruction manual. Instead, it sets out a series of signposts and a strategic direction of travel for the government to consider. As you can see from the, uh, the, the, the slide behind me, this is not just the views of those 23 members. Because as representatives of the AI Council, the Council was founded on, sorry, as representatives of the AI ecosystem, the Council was founded on understanding that we would amplify the voices of the wider community. Not only did we connect with all the stakeholders in government, you can see on the left here, but consulted over 450 individuals from our network, using an online survey to ensure diversity of thought and experience was captured. The report has two key messages. First, that the UK starts from, uh, sorry, first, 
that the UK starts from a position of strength in the fundamental enablers of AI development, which is often forgotten. R&D, skills, infrastructure, and so on, which speaks to our thriving ecosystem we already have. And we must double down on our investment in these areas. We can't grow, you know, hope to grow taller if we don't maintain a solid foundation on which they're built. And second, we talk about the fact we must remain ready to adapt to the coming disruptions that AI brings to the economy and society. This means keeping our eyes fixed firmly on the horizon to reflect this rapid pace and evolution. So not just over the next five years, but the next five decades too. Preparing now for a time that is too far out even to contemplate without feeling like science fiction, let alone predict. And all of this led us to call the government to develop a national AI strategy, focusing on where we have unique advantages and where we can collaborate internationally to maximize our impact. We've had really positive feedback for the Secretary of State. And so we're working hard to get even more information from all of you in the ecosystem. And I'll explain more how to do that in a moment. Before I do, just to give you a flavor of some of the recommendations, I do hope you will check out the actual roadmap. We recommend four different pillars, scaling up public sector investment in fundamental AI research and committing to a 10 year program of high level AI skills building, but also a section on adoption, where we focus on both increasing bio capability across all sectors, company sizes, including the public sector, as well as supporting the AI startup vendor community. We point to how AI can support the NHS to deliver the best healthcare, support complex challenges of net zero carbon emissions, and keep the country safe and secure. There's an emphasis on consolidating and accelerating the infrastructure and governance that needs to increase for a robust data sets as well. And none of this would be possible without the public being able to trust companies. So there's a section where we describe how this is enabled through public scrutiny, and we'll touch more on that later. What's next? Well, that's ultimately why I came to talk to you today, because I need you all to get involved. We want to activate the community further and turn as many of the recommendations in our roadmap and more into community owned actionable asks that can be put to the government as it considers the response and next steps for growing AI in the UK. I'm excited to hear what you all think in this forum, at the Q&A, at future workshops, Ultimately, we need your feed feedback if we're going to forge a brighter future together. So if you head to the AI Council, um, sorry, the uh, AI Council website, there is a form where you can register your interest and we will all be in touch. And I really do hope you do that. You could do that now if you'd like while I keep talking. So. The other reason I agreed to come and talk today is because I hope that there are some lessons from my experience writing how to talk to robots that I can share that might be useful. How to Talk to Robots was born out of a talk I was giving in 2018 at an event hosted by the achingly cool magazine for women called Repost in the creative industries. I looked around the room and I realized that I couldn't give my usual positive speech about AI and business. These women were at the top of their fields, media, fashion, film, et cetera. And I needed to explain why AI would matter to them. It dawned on me how many women's careers would be destroyed by smart machines, and they weren't even gonna see this an army coming. If they weren't aware of how AI was set to change all the rules, how would they know how to master them? Luckily, Michelle Kane, a publisher at HarperCollins was in the audience, and she agreed that this rallying cry was needed to be heard. And so, we wrote How to Talk to Robots with, a help, uh, with this hope that we could ensure that women would work out how AI could work for them, not they for it. And in the book, I give the audience of savvy women who don't currently care about AI or think of themselves as techie, some pieces of advice. It is important to say that this book, though targeted at women and marginalized genders, I aim to consider everyone and especially all people who are currently underrepresented in the conversation about tech and AI. The pieces of advice are not directly for those listening today at all. I mean, you all understand the importance of AI, but I'm going to share because I believe a little of what I think these people and these women need could shed some advice on what I think that the practitioners, policymakers, researchers, business people, and all of you at the forefront of this technology might need to know. The book starts with a history of AI showing the traditional list of lone geniuses on the left and the, on the right, the groups of women who came together to advance AI. 
as on Ottilie and Lesser, CEO of UKRI recently said, the cult of the lone genius just isn't helpful. So I wanted to show the reader how they can fit into the part of the wider community to advance the research. Uh, and the second chapter, we in I interview Karen Ho at MIT to explore what AI is technically. And there are some exercises for people to try out. We explain here that I use the term robots as a proxy for AI, but that not all AI is robots. <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, so it, for those of you who are already asking, why did I use the title? We do make very clear in the book that uh, it is not the same thing. There's a bumper chapter on all the rewards that AI offers from climate to health and just making jobs that are less dangerous, dull and dirty. And of course, an even bigger chapter on all the risks, which I don't need to tell you about. Finally, there's an extensive book list because really uh, this is just the start of the reader's journey. I wanted to signpost the brilliant thinkers of our time and, uh, and you can uh, see almost a, a fifth of the book is that book list. But before the list, there are these five recommendations. The first thing that we need to embrace change. We start with Dorothy Vaughan. And we start with Dorothy Vaughan. As told by the movie and the book, Hidden Figures, I paint the picture of Dorothy. Feeling threatened by the new machines she saw rolling into her workstation, she embraced them. And with the confidence and foresight to predict the next phase of technology, she taught herself to code Fortran for the new IBM computers and ensured that she had the skills to stay ahead. She didn't stop there. She then trained her human computer team and ensured they were primed for change. Rather than being made redundant, they evolved to new jobs. The fact she did all of this as a black woman during racial segregation is to me the most inspiring story. I encourage the reader to be comfortable with the uncertainty and prepare to understand the vulnerabilities and focus on their often hidden strengths and the skills needed for disruption. And I offer some thought experiments to help the reader see how they can prepare themselves. But really, people shouldn't have to think like Dorothy. Governments and organizations should preempt the change and prepare people. I'm all for self-help, which is why I wrote the handbook, but industry, government and academia need to up the ante on considering the impact that this technology will have well before it impacts people's jobs and start making a plan of retraining embedded into the R&D and the adoption life cycle. In the roadmap, we suggest an academy for AI, inspired in part by the finished elements of AI. We wrote that it would help to ensure that trustworthy information in relevant and accessible forms reach the right people. We suggest that it draws from the forefront of research, development and innovation, such as through the Alan Turing Institute. And the academy's main objective would be to help more people live and work with AI. But it would also be well-placed to help connect and support innovative, uh, initiatives involving public engagement and public dialogue, connecting people for discussion around the big topics of the day. Because it's not just about reskilling and the owners shouldn't just be on the individual to embrace change, especially if it could impact them negatively. The downside of the risk can't just be on the individual. It's about a cultural shift in the importance of the worker. Today, it's clear which jobs will be slaved to the algorithm. In time, it's gonna be less clear. And so it's vital that enough is done to recognize, limit, and ultimately, if we can't regulate it out culturally, make it impossible to build AI that ruins lives. As Sarah O'Connor recently wrote in the FT, dehumanization and intensification of work is not, is not inevitable, but a different outcome will require different choices and different distribution of power in the workplace. If we are to have robot colleagues, we need to design processes around the strengths and fragilities of the human with ways for them to voice problems, propose solutions and claim a share of the productivity gains. It's about encouraging people to demand the progress they want rather than embrace the change that's happening to them. My advice on this is both quite specific and, and quite broadly more culturally. I'm very conscious that if we're to have an AI guided future, the reader needs to become the best at leveraging their guide. So it works for them, not them for it. And so I'm always thinking about how to craft the best question. And I really, whether it's, I don't know, set my alarm, search the web, direct me without traffic. I have a new thing where I ask Siri to translate things into Japanese because it makes my son laugh. But I want readers to do the same because things like voice assistants uh, and other AI systems are now in their workplace. 
apparently there are not yet AI in pub tills, but they are in marketing products, sales tools, call centers, routing people day to day. And it's about training the muscle memory to get used to making sort of the most of these tools. But it's not just about the individual. Again, it's about starting in, in, in schools. I, uh, I was thinking if data science and the concepts of AI would talk across all subjects, not jettison to that kind of computer science lab, you'd quickly have other people understanding why it was important to them and not something for others. And we talk about this as advised by Frank Kelly in the AI roadmap. And as I said, it's not just about the individual but about the cultural memory as a whole, a national conversation. I want people to feel part of AI and its developments. And I often think this can be done by using humor. As I said before, I loved Robot Wars because it was real people making real things, but ultimately it was just fun. So how about a great British tech off? And AI's got talent, AI factor. Kids could use Python to make magic uh, eight balls rather than baking Battenberg cake. Crystal maze with like a half human, half robot team. Facial recognition that choreographs dances. I cheered from the rafters when in RuPaul's Drag Race, Tia Coffey dressed as Alan Turing. And when the girls at STEM from dance use their movements to light up the diodes in Beyonce's songs. I believe there needs to be a fun way to awaken people's interest so that they can make their own choices and stop being passive contributors. They can say they don't want to be involved in any of it. One friend, just before I showed them this presentation said this sounded like absolute hell, but at least this would give people the information in a lighthearted way in, so they could make knowing decisions. Ultimately, there's a lot of debate about how to do this. And we have a working group uh, called AI Narratives led by Claire T Craig, and I would absolutely just love to hear all your thoughts. The third piece of advice is protect yourself. In the risk section of the book, I talk about how decisions that affect the lives of the reader are made or influenced by computer systems that they don't yet see. From insurers to police to the Department for Education, Amazon and Facebook, power is exercised through algorithmic systems used to grade and sort people, as you all know. I interviewed Sandra Wodcha to talk about the regulation that's in place like GDPR, because I felt like in the book we needed something for people to be understand that there were some ways to protect themselves today. I was pretty sure my friends thought GDPR was just an annoying thing they had to deal with at work, not something on their side. And so I polled them and not one knew that they had the right to be forgotten on social media platforms. I also point to law firms like Fox Club that are on hand to fight injustice in the hope that people feel less alone when it comes to big injustices. The challenge is AI is pushing the boundaries of what, safely, what safety now looks like and what regulation now is going to be. And it, so far, regulation has not been able to keep up with the pace of change. In the roadmap, the council made clear they believe that the exploration and scrutiny of government uh, of appropriate governance mechanisms, particularly concerning public sector adoption of AI is of course overdue. We shine a light on the need for adaptive and informed regulation as part of an enabling environment of good governance and point out that this includes public engagement and transparency measures. Developing and deploying trustworthy AI will depend on the UK strengthening its governing environment in a matter that both provides guidance and confidence to businesses to innovate and adopt AI, as well as ensuring that the public uh, that use AI is safe, secure, fair, ethical, duly overseen by independent entities. But regulation is only part of the story. I believe the AI ecosystem has to hold itself to higher standards than previous waves of technologists. With greater power comes greater responsibility. Everyone listening, whether you're researching AI techniques or rolling them out at a corporate writing policy, or you're new to the topic, you have the power to change things. It's been amazing to watch Ada Lovelace and others really push at this over the last few years and months, and I'm excited to see more. But it's not enough for the work to be done only by civil society. I believe companies building AI need to commit to sustained public engagement and incorporation of public views in their research now. We can't expect the public to have to protect their own rights, but there should be an option for them to be able to get involved. And like those currently building AI systems, craft the future where humans do flourish. And so that's why the fourth piece of advice that I give the reader is I encourage them to be part of the conversation. I acknowledge that it's not always easy for them to get into the room where the decisions are being made, but I suggest they try and become part of the team at some stage of the process. 
There's a section on how to get into building AI for those of you who are inspired into the science and Dame Wendy, and Dame Wendy Hall and the council recommend important diversity issues and uh, initiatives in the roadmap. And for those non-technical people, I suggest they focus their unique expertise and we all know, as we all know, AI projects need things like designers, artists, journalists, and people who can translate these real world experiences. But also just being part of the wider discord. I suggest book clubs, after school groups, company interest groups, and AI parties, which might be stretching it a bit, but the idea as coined by Alex Dunn is to give people the confidence to hone their technical intuition and get rid of this notion that they have to be technologists to have technological conversations that are useful. But again, it's not just the public's job. The industry has a crucial role in ensuring that when underrepresented voices do get into the room, they're welcomed with open arms, listened to and valued. It's about training existing teams and putting in place the right structures. Cindy Gallup's tweet in response to Google's training more black women in digital skills was a good point and one that other corporates could heed. She said, you need to announce initiatives to train 100,000 white men in acknowledging, valuing, championing, hiring, promoting, bonusing, and rewarding the skills of black women. And as Brittany Smith, the new policy director for Data Society, who I spoke to while planning this talk said, this is gonna require starting to value lived experiences equally with academic expertise. This requires challenging power dynamics and building expertise in disciplines like decolonial theory to support in that effort. It requires people to name scientific racism, oppose it, and resolve to remedy it. None of this is going to be easy. She asks us to reject the vague promises of social benefit and work instead to realize justice. And she reminds us that this is not one project or one team, but the community, and we need really for it to be our entire reason for being. We discussed which AI company might be the first to hire a senior research historian or vice president of community organizing because ultimately communities are the best way to build things for communities. In the past, you could have had a bedroom coder, but I believe the most wonderful thing about AI is that in order for it to work for everyone, you need everyone involved in its working. The creation of, a, of ARIA, this 800 million pound initiative to fund high risk and high reward research, which some of you might remember being called ARPA or DARPA, uh, framed on, on DARPA, has this potential to change the world for the better. Uh, I believe it's an exciting step for UK science. And the government has been clear that they won't prescribe the research, but instead are looking for daring leaders to both decide and drive the research innovation. I wonder what it would look like if they started searching for daring communities instead of daring individuals, collectives, groups of people from all walks of science and humanity, breaking new ground, developing hard to succeed innovation together with the public. Because like Mariana Matsukatu said, we need to revive notions of public value and public person, uh, purpose. I don't for one moment think this is easy, but we need to figure out how we're going to co-create and co-shape the next wave of AI research and technology at a pace that allows for debate, deliberation and thoughtful applications. In summary, I believe the use of AI has the potential to be the greatest savior and maybe even leveler of our time, addressing the climate crisis in ways that we thought previously, previously impossible, fighting healthcare challenges that could only ever be dreamt of, but there's also a risk of increasing inequality and ravaging the planet even more than we do today. I believe that the greatest challenge of our time is reducing inequality, which has now widened due to COVID and will continue to widen with the climate crisis. And a human empowered AI enabled future, if responsibly built in collaboration with the general public could go much of the way to supporting a brighter future and enable us to move towards a world of human flourishing. So as Amanda Gorman said, there is always light if we were brave enough to see it and brave enough to be it. I want you all to think about the cracks you can see. Let others in, mix things up. It can be about lifting off your blinkers to look outside yourself. Where you usually go for solutions don't, doesn't always have to be the place to look. Don't block it out. There's a burst of light trying to come through. And as Roosevelt said, yours is not the task of making your way in the world, but the task of remaking the world which you find before you. So I wish you all the courage to get going in that remaking. Thank you very, very much. Brilliant, brilliant. Can, can people hear me? Can you hear me, Tabitha? I can hear you. 
Thank you so much, Tabitha, for an inspiring and fantastic talk. I'm sure we're going to get loads of questions from the audience. Please do enter them in the Q&A tab um, at the bottom of the screen. But first, if it's OK, we're going to have a bit of a, a fireside chat, and then we'll open up a bit more. Good. So um, let me start with, with something that I know you're very passionate about. You've quite rightly spoken about the needs for diversity. Uh, and particularly to find ways to involve women in the design, development, and deployment of AI systems. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that the, the Turing Public Policy Program, working with the wonderful Judy Waxman at LSE, are going to be releasing a report on March 8 on International Women's Day about um, some specific recommendations for how we can try to involve uh, women more in, in all of those important aspects of data science and AI. Um, I also just wanted to mention one of my favorite Turing quotes that I think resonates with a lot of things you've said. I'm sure you know this one. Sometimes it is the people no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. It's beautiful. beautiful I need beautiful. that in my slide. That's brilliant. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, well, Turing, as you know, was, was really an amazing and inspiring man in, in many, many ways. Yeah. Um, but I just wonder, you, you already laid out some ways that we can try to engage with more people, but is there any more we can do to help everyone get involved? I think it's, it's, it's a real challenge. And for a while, I was daunted by that challenge until I realized that everything in, in R&D is a challenge. And so we just have to put our minds to it as being as important as the challenge of the research and development. Um, I'm really thrilled that the, the, the Turing are, are releasing this report on um, International Women's Day because in the, in the roadmap, we talk about the fact that there, there needs to be so much more done in diversity and inclusion initiatives. And there's so many good like grassroots things, but there really isn't something that, ex that exposes so much of the, of the um, or tracks and exposes the challenges that we have, which then therefore makes it even harder to do the work. So I'm excited to hear that that's happening. Fantastic. Relates to that, I often come across people who are um, excited to, to, to contribute to policy issues. So I wonder, beyond your fantastic AI Council website, where people can make some comments, do you have any other ideas for how people can get involved with policy issues? Well, I mean, I do, but I have to say the website is the way because ultimately what I find myself in these in these forums is I'm like, message me because I'm so you know excited about um, talking to people directly about these things and funneling them through. Um, but really the, the website's a good way to do that without me breaking. But what I what I guess I ultimately mean is that, you know, put, put, putting your hand up is the is the first step. And that this website is a proxy for putting your hand up and um, we are running a series of workshops um, between now and the end of the year that will dig into elements um, that the office for ai who are doing a lot of the strategy work or who are doing the strategy work um, need more advice on and this is where we will come to individuals who um, who put their hands up and want to get involved in those topics and what i find is there isn't a quick fix for this um, and I'm looking for, and so actually do come directly to me if you have some other suggestions for how um, public engagement and, but also ecosystem engagement has worked really well for you in the past. Because at the moment we're using quite traditional ways of doing this, um, whether it's surveys, um, but also, and, and one-on-ones and workshops. If there are other cool ideas, cooperative models, I'm like all is. Fantastic, so yes, please do. Heed that call, please do um, go to the website and submit your, your thoughts and comments. And Tabitha, um, you've achieved so much already. What do you want to do next? I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm really loving what I'm doing today. Um, I, I feel like I'm part of something so much bigger than me and it hasn't yet decided what I need to do next. Um, I, it sound, that sounds a little bit fatalistic, but I don't mean it like that. I mean, I, um, I think that as the ecosystem decides what it needs to do, I'm, I'm, you know, I sign myself up for that. Hmm. So, yes, I'm wondering if we can, I'm wondering if you want to try to, to turn that into any sort of advice for people who are starting out, how they can think about how best to contribute. Yeah, I think the people who are starting out um, 
there's sort of there's two pieces of advice is one is like study hard um be the most uh prepared person in the room uh you know i'm embarrassed i didn't know that cheering quote for example but it's all online it's all there um be the person who knows all of the different elements so then you bring something to the ecosystem that you have as a unique uh as a sort of a unique um offering I guess and it doesn't need to be that you've been studying something forever it just needs to be that you have a unique insight um and so I think that would be the first and and the second is decide um I often think like decide or often advise like decide how that journey is going to go but be very happy for it to take lots of different paths um traditionally you know you maybe people had my grandparents had one job my parents had maybe two i've already had three four or five you know it's it's endless and i think not beating yourself up if things aren't going in a linear direction is is incredibly important or at least i definitely don't <laughs> fantastic so uh we're getting some some really interesting questions coming in on the Q&A. Please, everyone, do keep typing in questions or have a look through what other people have asked and upvote them if you like them. Um, we're getting some good upvoting going on. So I think uh, Luke Richards, if you don't mind, will be asking a bit later to, to come and ask your question. Um, but next up, we're going to go to, uh, to some Slido questions. And hopefully these are going to be interesting for, for the audience. We're gonna see how people respond. Jesse, can we bring up the first Slido question? Fantastic. Hmm. Tabitha, do you want to talk people through this? <laughs> so, so this this uh, this Slido question, everybody has said 100% to one answer, and I and I think that it's worth me explaining why I asked this. So, when I um, uh, when I, I'm obsessed, I've, I've got an 18 month old, and I'm totally obsessed with parenting books, and I'm and I oh good, some people are changing their minds, um, and I. I really got into Maria Montessori and Maria Montessori talks about um, how parents should be uh, not a boss or a servant of their child, but actually their guide. And so because I'm like deep in parenting paranoia, I, I am also deep in AI paranoia and I, I can't help but think that potentially Maria, Maria Montessori's advice was really good for us uh, as an AI ecosystem, as well as us being me and my partner as parents and ultimately could we make it the cultural norm um, that AI is always a, a guide or a, uh, or a chum, or I think Andrew Ning thinks of it as like a Jiminy Cricket to a human rather than, um, rather than it being something that we are the boss of or it is the boss of us. Um, so Adrian, I don't know what your thoughts are because this is, can obviously be a little bit pater like paternalistic and really AI shouldn't be a parent at all. And I've stretched the analogy a bit too far, but it, it made me think. Mm. Well, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. I think almost all of us naturally start anthropomorphizing all sorts of things and, and, and wondering how we can analogize our relationship with anything mm. to our relationship with our children or our parents, because of course those are the ones that are close to hand. But I, I wonder, it, my personal view is that maybe particularly over the next decade or two, there'll be many situations where AI hopefully can be a sort of partner to work with us um, I don't know if it will be like Jiminy Cricket. I think that's a really interesting example. I don't know who, how many people have seen that fantastic Disney Pinocchio film where Jiminy Cricket essentially plays the role of a conscience to the emerging mind of Pinocchio. And it's, and it's a fascinating <laughs> thing. I don't know that AI is ready to be our conscience. I think no. quite the opposite. I think uh, we, it's really important that we recognize that humans and AI have different strengths and weaknesses. Mm. And particularly perhaps it's the weaknesses in ourselves and in AI, which we need to acknowledge. Um, and so that we can work well together. So I, I wonder if maybe rather than a guide servant or boss, maybe an AI can be um, a bit more like some sort of alien, alien spouse. Something which, I love that. <laughs> yeah, something which which we need to recognize is quite different from ourselves. And but yeah. we're yeah yeah there's that there's that poem the, the the oak and the cedar they do not grow in each other's shade maybe it's a little like that oh that's beautiful yeah although it's going to be really interesting because i think over time we'll see i wonder can we bring up the second slide though while, while we're just yeah. talking about that if possible jesse um one difference between oak and cedar trees is that the ai is constantly changing so we have to keep getting yes. as it's changing 
Um, yes, oh my God, that's an that's an added added pain. But then again, so are, so are, so are humans. So so are you and your partner that should not be growing in each other's shade. That's right. So we have learned how to grow with adaptive. That's hope. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Great. Uh, gosh, yes. Yeah, so, so which aspects of AI? Are people most excited about? None of it. That's a great answer. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here today. <laughs> <laughs> good to good to know. Yes. Health breakthroughs, co-creativity. I'm really excited about that too. Yeah, I really like co-creativity. Saving time. There's some really good answers here. Yeah. As we see these come in, what what are you most excited about, Tabitha? Oh, sorry, did you want to? No. Well, as I see these coming in, I can't help but think like this is what we should focus my TV show on. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, When's that starting? That's next month, is it? Oh, no, I no, no. <laughs> I actually thought the first second. I wish. I mean, we need, we need to convince one of the TV execs that this is a good idea. So maybe there's a, maybe it's sort of, uh, yeah, maybe it's a great British healthcare tech off, you know, rather than it, as healthcare is really the one that is coming up the highest. And, and even the smaller ones of, around like drug discovery, if you added those together, you would definitely be seeing people most interested um, in healthcare. I like the agriculture one, my partner's a, a farmer. So that's always a big one for me as well. I, I think I'm most excited about um, how AI can address the climate crisis in ways that we just haven't been able to today. Um, because that will inevitably and is already a healthcare crisis too. Um, I feel like it's the it's the it's it, it's the biggest threat to inequality. It's the biggest threat to to everything. And I can now see climate change climbing up climbing up the rankings. Yeah. Um, but you know everything is everything is a climate change challenge and everything's a healthcare challenge. And and there are areas where we just cannot uh, as we have not been able to to solve like alpha fold you know like what like deep mind with alpha fold there was an area that was just unscientifically you know impossible to have resolved until we were able to to uh to apply ai and i think that that's really what excites me the most brilliant Let, let's keep the slider up just 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 for a couple of minutes more and explore this a bit so i think i think the, the topics which are coming out here are really exciting ones like you mentioned mm. um maybe we can talk a little bit about healthcare and education if that's okay so in healthcare sure. wonderful that people are really excited about possibilities and i certainly am too do you have any thoughts on whether ai has done as well as we would have hoped in battling covid um it's a really it's a really difficult question i think for the ecosystem to ask itself um i think that the ai the ai ecosystem will be really ready if God forbid there is another pandemic. Um, I think that artificial intelligence in itself and the stage at which the industry was progressing at the point that the pandemic hit, um, the systems weren't in place for real, that, that, that level of real world problem at scale. Um, and so I think the areas where AI has been applied, like the work that the Turing were doing, um, it has been really successful, but it hasn't been the magic wand that I think some people would have liked to, to have been. Um, but anybody, anyone doing a retrospective would, would never have actually placed AI at the heart of solving the pandemic's problems uh, if they you know, have the, the hindsight. What I am hopeful for, and I've definitely seen is that we the the AI ecosystem is now start to see like where it can for other health crises and potentially other pandemics where AI should be applied and where it shouldn't. You know, the logistics in hospitals, I think, was a you know is, is very different to track and trace and all of these things that you know it's just not one problem. It's hundreds and hundreds of different challenges. Completely agree, and many of those challenges are not related to AI. But one right. one of the things which has come up through the, the Turing workshops that Mike Wildridge organized and the work mm -hmm. the Royal Society did um, is that it will really be helpful if we can get set up in order to have better access to high quality data and get that out to people more quickly uh, and fi find ways to be able to share that. I think both nationally and internationally, that's likely to be a really important avenue. Totally. Um, I think, I think that 
the fact that when, when people were disappointed in AI not being able to solve things, they, they really showed that they didn't understand that it needed data before <laughs> to, 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 to work. And, and once you point that out, everyone suddenly realized, oh, no wonder from a cold start, AI wasn't solving all the problems. <laughs> I love that we. I like the pair. pairing the socks. Yeah, pairing socks because that's a very challenging thing for the humans that I know. Um, but it is a good point, pairing socks, because I want to call that out, and I'm. It's very. It's funny, and I am all about jokes. But equally, I have a. I have a. I have like this feeling sometimes whereby I'm frustrated that sometimes AI is being pointed at things that aren't like useful for society. And I don't mean to call out the pairing socks because that's funny and we should totally have that. But And very um, useful for society. It is very useful. Uh, well, very useful for individuals. Um, and I, and, and I, I wish that there was more energy um, around sort of, or, or less energy, ignoring ideas that kind of ideas, whether it's research or, or in, you know, business of AI that, is not is not helping like we don't need more targeting of our advertising like we totally need more sorting of our rubbish we need more cleaning of the oceans we need so many other things and so i, I kind of wish that all the the, the 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 incredible talent was pointed at the the, the real big challenges um, and i don't mean just public good i just you know the bigger challenges i think it's it's really it, you know most of the things here um are definitely uh, are definitely that and yet a lot of the funding goes into uh you know things that are better for i don't know making ai that feng shui is your room <laughs> you know, it's things like that i'm just not sure about and yeah it gets press all the time absolutely we need, we need to, to know where to focus um i wonder if it's okay let's chat a little bit about education but jesse are you yeah. able to move on to the next slider so people can think about that while we talk about education the reason i want to talk about, about education is that I think it's been um, well over a decade now that people have been saying that AI is going to have an amazing revolutionary impact in education. That's going to enable yeah. personalized courses for everyone where they'll be able to learn in the way that's appropriate for them at the pace it's appropriate for them. But that's proven to be a lot more challenging. Than I think many people hoped. Any thoughts on that? Rose Luckin is my go-to on AI and education and Priya Lakhani is actually on the council. And so I get, I'm very lucky I get um, to spend a lot of time thinking about this with, with experts. Um, I don't think just because it hasn't materialized, we should give up. Um, I, as a dyslexic and someone who really struggled with like rote learning and like one to many in the classroom, um, I feel like for me, I would have really benefited from a more personalized experience. Um, I definitely would have benefited from more teacher support rather than them having so much in, like o cognitive overload of, of things like the marking, you know, marking and everything else and where I would start where I would demand if I was a teacher is I quite like AI to do the bits of the work that isn't in the classroom and isn't with the, the young people. Um, because the more a teacher can spend with an individual, I don't know what the stat is, but I'm pretty sure if, you know, they, they learn quicker and faster and better. Um, I, the pandemic, I, I will have sped up a lot of that for the very wealthy schools and I think that this is a, a real challenge is that um, when you talk about AI and education you you quite quickly jump to or I quite quickly jump to um, sort of like the, the like the the Ferrari version but we've got to think about like what does um, what does the version look like that's rolled out to everybody and I, I don't see that being ready at, yet um, and so as we know, if you get things wrong with an education, you're ruining generations um, potential. And so we have to be even more careful in this space than in any, any other space, which I guess again, brings me back to like, let's use AI to, to, to do the really boring bits and, and make sure that that can then foster more human create connection between teachers and pupils and between pupils and each other. Because ultimately that's how I learned. Uh, learned. Personally, it was all about like, the interaction with the other um with the other young people the other students um it's all about teamwork and so the more we can be doing that kind of thinking in schools the better i'm sh i'm sure of that 
but again, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I to have this debate or discussion, uh, I think you really need to have more teachers and more young people themselves. I, I'm one of the advisors for teens in AI, and I get so much value out of spending time with people who are at school, with them explaining what it actually feels like. Um, anyone who's listening, uh, you can sign up as a mentor to teams and AI, and you can give, back, give a little back, but honestly, you'll get so much uh, thought in return. Fantastic point. I can completely agree with your um, with your points about how, how can we help AI to help and support teachers who do an amazing and often underappreciated job, and also to help people themselves learn and sort of take mm. more ownership of learning by themselves and with their fellow students. So wonderful points. Thank you. Um, maybe we can chat about this next slide. And while we're doing that, um, we've got some people who are rising up on the Q&A. So um, if Luke Richards and Jerry Kopich can get ready with Jesse to be ready to ask their live questions soon. Um, oh, the slide has disappeared. Jesse, can we have that slide back, which I hope it's still got <laughs> data. It was showing us what people are worried about. I mean, bias was the big one. Oh, no. Well, OK. I just saw it was like bias in the middle. <laughs> it was bias and other things. Yeah, well, uh, I think. Um, I'm sure you're worried about bias. Well, we can. I guess we can leave. We can leave this uh, this this interesting question up. Um, mm. Any anything you want to comment about bias or other concerns that you have about AI in the next ten years? I think. I think. Honestly, uh, I think I made. I hope I made in in what I was saying um, before quite clear is that I'm worried about lots of things but I can't always know what next to worry about um, and that that's why we need this sort of public community focus because I come with my own bias and and privilege and it makes it um it makes it incredibly important that in the same way as we like personalize down to the person when we're going to sell them um you know, when the industry wants to sell them bikinis, we're also personalizing down to the individual when we think about bias. And I don't think we're doing that. We kind of think about bias as this whole one big thing, um, or at least I do. And some of the people that I get to speak to on this, um, the, 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 the real world experts that have started to come together uh, every day and i can't believe i'm using twitter as an example but every day on twitter i i learn something new that has that is causing more harm than good from from the tech world every day there's a new fire to put out uh also not even fire to put out fire burning um and i think that's why i made this point around like there are so many cracks we've got to let the light in and everyone's got a job to play in it um yeah Fantastic. We're getting a friendly nudge that to try to keep, if we can, our question, our answers a little bit shorter. Um, oh yeah, sorry. So we can get some. <laughs> I'm like arming. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, any quick thoughts on on what you see here? Do you do you like the results here? What should be prioritized? So I asked this question because I wanted to like dig into the data later. So. Um, I think we we can we can let people continue to answer this poll. You know, skills and diversity has come up top. I think. Um, that obviously makes sense to me, but um, uh, better to, to, I can dig into this this one later, I think. Okay, great. So let, let's move to um, the first questions from our audience. I think first up we have Ada Mahonik, and um, and I'll just say that in addition to Luke Richards and Jerry Kopic, uh, if David Angelelli can get ready, because people seem to love his question too. Do we have Ada ready to be able to ask Hello. her question? Um, well, thank you. Great to see you. And um, thank you for this such a wide ranging and fascinating talk. And my question is really, what did you enjoy the most about um, writing and publishing this book? That's such a good question. Um, I actually found it incredibly painful. The, the, um, <laughs> the overarching feeling is, is that. But I think the answer should be that I loved interviewing all of the amazing women um, that I interviewed at the back of the book. But the truth which I think you will, you, will, you will know very well, is that um, I had my son a month early, uh, a month before the book was set to be finished or handed in. And um, 
I was very lucky and I, you know, this is, this is not a secret. I talk about this in the back of the book, but I was very lucky that I had a, uh, somebody to help me write the book and somebody to help me research the book. Uh, Gemma um, Reeves and Eve, um, I can't, oh my God, I can't suddenly remember her surname. Two amazing people and they really were my favorite part of the book. Um, and I, I, you know, I talk about communities and, and how things are built with multiple women. And for me, writing the book was a community spirited exercise. I didn't do it alone. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, how did you do that? And the answer is I did not do it alone. Um, uh, and that was definitely the most fun. I actually sat in the uh, the British Library looking at the, the Turing um, with them most days in, in the coffee shop until Otis, my little son was born. And then everything was done um, over the phone and over Zoom, which at the time felt very strange, but now would have been very normal. <laughs> Um, and um, that was, you know, joyous. Um, fantastic, thank you. And I really loved um, your point about um, perhaps uh, daring communities um, to award within art, but that was, um, yeah, just one, a wonderful thought. Thank you. Well, I'll, we'll join in together. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ada. Um, next thing we have a question from Ashley Kiensley. Do we have Ashley? I think he's coming in now. Oh, hi. Hi, Ashley. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I still haven't gotten used to Zoom. Uh, so really like the talk, super, super interesting. You talked a lot about getting community involved and um, some other ways, you know, having more diverse folks in the industry, but how do we ensure robots don't inherit the problems that humans have? So such as biases or you know, robots don't seem to have central or peripheral processing, but we know that often we uh, peripherally process when we should be central processing. What else can we do practically as practitioners or, or yeah, folks in the space to, to really ensure that we're fighting this? That's a very good and very tough, tough question. And the good news is that you have one of the world's experts in this that way. <laughs> Adrian, um, I feel like you can answer that question a lot better than I would be able to, um, especially for the practitioners out there. Gosh, um, a great question, Ashley. And it's, it's a question which deserves a long discussion, but maybe just a few quick thoughts are that it's really, it's wonderful. That, it's wonderful, although it's of course humbling for all of us, to recognize that indeed we humans do have problems and biases of our own. So there's a lot of attention on transparency of machine decisions and bias in machines decision, machine decisions. But we should start by acknowledging that actually we ourselves are we're rather opaque in how we make decisions or even when we try to explain ourselves, there's quite a lot of evidence that sometimes we might not really be explaining exactly how we came to a conclusion, but just maybe give a convenient uh, answer to that might be socially helpful at that instance. Um, and we are quite biased ourselves. So a lot of the bias that we see in machine learning systems is arising because those systems are trained on data that comes from past human decisions. So those algorithms are learning from our, 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 human, uh, our human errors. Um, in some ways, well, there's, there's of course, there's, there's hope for both of us. There's hope for humans and there's hope for machines. That's a positive message. And in some ways, machines are a bit easier to deal with because you can program the machine and you can sort of tweak the way that it's going to deal with data and the way it's going to see the world, whereas it's generally much harder to do that with humans. However, of course, it's much easier to interact with humans in some other way. So again, I think we need to recognize that humans and machines have different strengths and weaknesses. We need to try to find ways to, to get the best out of both. And so I think that for, for the foreseeable future, there's going to be a, a lot of interesting work to do in how can we best combine humans and machines together. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. I think next we have uh, Sarah Gray. Uh, hi, thank, thanks both. Really, really fascinating discussions. Uh, my question is, um, what role are librarians and archivists playing in relation? Oh no, we lost her. Oh, I think the question is, uh, what roles are librarians and archivists playing in relation to the AI roadmap? So I, I love that. I love that question. I wonder if um, Sarah is a librarian. Oh, there, here she is. She's back, Sarah. Sarah, are you a librarian or an archivist? You are mute, Sarah. Sorry, I was uh, 
lost and refound. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, what, what role do you maybe perhaps can you foresee for librarians and archivists um, within that? I know, for example, that SILIP kind of contributed to the, the national data strategy, for example. Um, are, you, are you a librarian or an archivist? Um, yeah, in the, in the field of, of, of librarianship. Um, and and actually, your comments about um, the, the, the AI as the guide um, also made me think of this. So there's um, yeah. Ronald Staveley and, and um, Lionel McColvin and those back in the, the, the time, the past times of librarianship. Yeah. You've talked to the librarian as, as, as a kind of the reader's guide and a right. person in life to exploring. Yeah. Around them. Kind of like Cicero's Tito. I like that. I, I like that. We, I, I haven't thought about this very much. Um, I have to admit, but I think that you should come and talk to me because we should, we should figure out how uh, the recommendations in the roadmap do relate to librarians and archivists. What it does bring me to think about, though, is have you read Mr. Penumbra's bookstore, Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore? No, no, I haven't. No. Oh, my gosh. It is an amazing, amazing book about the role of librarians and, and actually in this case, a bookseller but who acts like a librarian much more um, in in capturing histories and then using artificial intelligence and supercomputers to um, find new worlds. It's really kind of a cool sci-fi uh, sci -fi book. So um, I think there's both a real way, but also we should think when it comes to the narratives I was talking about earlier, um, schools all have librarians. So that initially is something that people relate to. And I think the further away people who aren't academics get from school. So people like me, I hadn't thought about librarians enough because it's not something I interact with. And so maybe thinking about how librarians and archivists play a role in, in industry is, is actually quite helpful. Yeah, I mean, it was really the kind of, you know, some of like the, the if, um, IFLA, so that's the, the world's kind of global body for libraries, if you like, they have um, their kind of set of um, statements around intellectual freedom. Um, right. Other things I thought were particularly relevant from, a, you know, a kind of qualitative rather than quantitative point of view in relation to all the discussions around bias and so on and so forth with. with yes. And, and the ethics of what you what you hand people as well. Yeah, and then obviously librarians have, have kind of historically also had this very interesting mm. role between technology and, you know, the public, if you like, and have been some mm. work, obviously, um, back in the day was our, our first kind of technological drive, if you like, and it was the light, you know, the public library and that took the brought the community on board with them. Yeah, that sense of trust. I just think there's a place there's an interesting place there that perhaps has been missed by the, the schism that happened way back in the day between you know, librarian yes. being part of computer science and then that yes. heading off onto its own. I'm totally with you. And Marcus Rashford is, 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 has been talking about the, the, the renewed role of the library. There's something there. I'd love to keep talking to you about this. Um, I'll, I'll uh, maybe get in touch on Twitter or, or Yeah, email. sure. Thank you. Super question, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for your responses. And a lovely library you have yourself in the background there. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's my background, so I have to say this is actually v Vita Sackville West. Okay, this is Sissy. Oh, well, good taste. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> good taste. Next up, we have Cohen van der Cavalle. And just while Cohen's getting ready, after that, we'll have Luke Richards, then uh, David Angelelli, and then Jerry Coppich. Hi. Hi, Tabitha. Um, yeah, I, I always love hearing you talk. You're like such an idol of mine. Um, I had a question um, for, for, so for people who don't have a programming background, but really want to kind of get involved in the conversation, whether it's um, how AI is shaping their own roles and professions, how it's shaping wider society, what kind of recommendations do you have for people like, like that, where it feels, it can feel quite a threshold if you don't have a programming background to get involved mm. in the conversations around this? Yeah, so there are, there are two things. Um, one is in, in the book I interview Alex Dunn and we talk about technical intuition and kind of how to hone it, how to find it, how to feel it, how to be under, like be comfortable with having conversations uh, that actually you probably have. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, you can speak French when, you, when you're drunk, but you can't when you're sober, or me anyway. You know, I get that. It's all there, it's in you. Um, that's a really bad analogy, but that, that would be the first. And then the second is um, to, to focus on what you are the best at. So if you're the best artist, if you're the best designer, if you're the best writer, if you're the best historian, um, if, you're, if you're just the best at talking to people, 
um, or, or, or not talking to people, your best librarian, reader, whatever it is that you are really good at. I think it's about making sure that you're the best at that and then seeing how that can relate to the technology. Because, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if your company is looking at rolling out artificial intelligence, kind of like they did in the pubs, if I'm the best bar staff, I'm gonna then have to work with the, with the AI, but I, I know how, let, let's think about how, I want the, 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 the till to be set up. I'm really stretching the analogy too far, but like being the person who knows about the real world experience is really vital. And I think I said this, which was, we can't have like the lone coder anymore. We have to have the, the people building the, the technology are in, encompassed by the real world experience. And so be the people who have the real world experience and then get it, get involved that way. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think great recommendation. I think it's also important that it's okay to ask questions. If you're the best yeah. at knowing how to uh, run a pub till, yes. then it's fine to ask the question of how yeah. does the technology work uh, and work together. Totally. And in fact, asking that question of those technologists makes them better at their job. Um, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. And I look forward to our campaign of putting Tia Coffee's Aling Turing suit in the Turing Institute. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> RuPaul. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Inside Tia. joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up, we have Luke Richards. Hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I found it really interesting. Um, you covered many of the modes of um, social inequality that AI may exasperate, um, but one area, um, not just in your talk, but in general, I feel, uh, that seems to be a blind spot um, is class. Mm. Those about the means to say, retrain or have the latitude to make the most of possible AI transformation. Um, do you think debates around AI have a class issue? And what do you think is the best way to democratize this? Debates about AI definitely have a class issue. Um, I think it's really good that you pointed that out. Um, I, I, I don't have an easy answer. I don't think there is an easy answer. We have to democratize this. Um, what, I, what I tried to do in, um, and actually, the, the end of the end of the book, there's one last piece of advice, which is um, about making ensuring that other people are heard. And I, I didn't talk about it today because I felt I'd gone on for long enough. But what I try and talk about there is um, once you do understand, it's finding people. You know, once you have become uh, you know aware of this, it's about finding other other people. And I did it, I did one small thing, um, which was the the proceeds of the book. They they go to a charity called Rosa. Um, well, it's actually not a charity. It's a fund for women's charities, and the the plan is um, that the they will they will search for charities that specifically look for for women that are being affected by automation. And this isn't that isn't a solution to what you've just described as being a class problem. But it was one way that I thought I could go in at least acknowledging that what I was doing was writing a book for women uh, who had the privilege to read the book, <laughs> had the time, had the money, um, had uh, the inclination, had the energy, all those things that, as you say, a lot of people don't have. Um, I think really the only way that I can think of as a quick, like, start is to point at it as a crack like you just have um and try and flood more light in as i hope that maybe i don't know what you what you do but maybe you have you have some some answers because together i think it's about it's about doing that and, and thinking what is this technology going to do for the least enfranchised person um and and making that part of the cultural psyche and I'm now going on way too long but there's a huge amount of work to be done Which and thank, is, thank you, you for raising that um yeah no I I work on the the, the defense side and democratizing AI and defense is oh, <laughs> almost amazing. impossible it's always impossible as well so I understand yeah. big debate to be had here thank you thank you it's a very important question um I think and hope we'll have time for three more questions we're gonna have David and then Jerry, and then Morale. So David, you're next, please. Hi. Hello, hi, thank you very much for your, for your talk and your uh, thoughts. Uh, so my question is, uh, I was um, recently reading this, uh, this book called The World Without Work that suggests that 
um, in the next few decades, technology and AI could potentially lead to, um, in a way, the disappearance of work in the sense that people uh, could potentially find themselves without, uh, without work. Um, and so I was wondering uh, how is the, I mean, the point that he makes uh, might be debatable and might be decades away, but uh, how do you think, uh, how the AI Council uh, has been thinking about the impact that AI could have on the job market? And most importantly, what do you think is the role for the government and businesses to address this problem of a world where uh, there will not be work at all or enough work? Mm. Uh, firstly, I think it's definitely the role of, of government and business to play. Um, we are, I don't have uh, a, an AI council view on, on this specific topic yet, but we are hosting workshops and working with people like the Institute for the Future of Work, as well as the unions about um, what, this, what this future looks like. And I think that's why we talk about in the roadmap looking short term at today, but also five to 50 decades. Um, so that then, uh, sorry, five years to, to, to 50, uh, so that then we can start having those conversations earlier. So it's a good, a really good question. Very important question, Debbie, thank you. Um, next, Jerry Kopich. Hi, thanks for Hi. a fascinating and insightful talk. Um, I, I wonder, do you think we're setting the bar rather low in trying to replicate human intelligence insofar as we're the species who's destroying its own habitat? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I, I'm going to think about that. I think it's a really good provocation. I hope you don't want me to answer. I'm not a philosopher. Um, that, um, that's something that we should think about. Please, please don't feel obligated to to to, uh, to attempt that just now. It's fine. <laughs> it's a great question, though. I'm gonna I'm gonna go and put a cold towel over my forehead. Can, can we have a quick Can I have a quick supplementary one then? Yeah. Um, that's 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 fairly innocuous, probably. Just to get into semantics for a second or two, I, I figure that in, the, in terms of the distinction between artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence, um, I, I rather favour non-human, goal-driven, adaptive behaviour as a definition of artificial intelligence. How do you feel? I, I like that too. Um, I'm all for uh, many different words for how we talk about uh, AI. The, the reason I, we, I use AI is because it's, it's the vernacular, it's the umbrella term, but all the versions that you just described and other people describe, I think are really important. And just even describing other ways of talking about AI is, is part of this dialogue and discussion. Thank you. Can I just have a quick comment? Um, so important, powerful questions. I think you need to be a little bit careful with the exact semantics of the way you phrase that, Jerry, because I, I wouldn't go with non-human goal directed. I think we want human goals. We want to be directed, mm. which I don't, it probably isn't your intent. We just need to be a bit careful with the sequence of the words there, but, but oh, I recognize that's debatable and relates to the first part of your question. I, I think we can conceptually try to split the notion of intelligence into intellectual capabilities, the ability to solve problems and wisdom, which in some senses is knowing which problems we should be trying to solve. And maybe the first part of your question is suggesting that perhaps humans haven't always demonstrated the greatest wisdom. Um, and that might be true, but I don't think we're at the point where AI is any wiser than humans. Perhaps it might be at some point in the distant future, but we should also recognize that intelligence has many different aspects to it, the intellectual capabilities. And of course, we've already achieved levels of AI that exceed human levels in certain areas at calculations, at playing chess, now at playing Go. And it feels like whenever, whenever an AI beats humans at doing something, we then move the goalposts and say, well, that wasn't very difficult. And humans are very special because we can do these other things. Humans are very special, but sometimes maybe we're not quite as special as we like to think. And I'm sorry, Jerry, I can see you've got lots more to say about that. Please be in touch if you want to continue, but let's just try and squeeze a few more questions into the remaining time. Thank you. Um, so next up, I think we have Maral. Um, hi, hello. How do I? Hello. Yeah, wait a second. Um, yeah, I don't know how to. 
We can oh, hear yeah. you. you. Can start. Think, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Hi. So I have two questions, but I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask you both, and then you can choose if you have time. So. <clears throat> My actually the most important questions for me right now is um, how do you um, find the strength um, to stay assertive in this field? Because for me, for instance, as I've been in this field for a couple of years, it gives me after some time, it uh, gave me a bit of a burnout because mm -hmm. people constantly expect you to prove that, um, I mean, in the tech field, in this male predominantly male field mm -hmm. i sometimes feel like i constantly need to prove that um i am not dumb which i don't know if you've uh, encountered that but um yeah the, i would like to be more assertive but you know you seem very assertive in the way you um present and speak and the way you um yeah and that's question number one. And the second one is about legal personhood. We can talk about it if you want. It's not that important to me at this point. Well, firstly, you're not dumb. You are actually quite assertive. It's amazing that you've come on here to ask your question um, and you're pretty amazing. So I, I think that my advice to keep up the, keep up putting yourself in situations that can often feel un quite uncomfortable like you are now, um, but ultimately the way that I have avoided, potentially avoided burnout um, is by surrounding myself with other women. Um, I have some incredible friends and it would be the worst thing for me to do to list them out now. But that, that you know, that I was talking about those events we started, the Why Women in AI, I honestly wouldn't be able to be where I am today without those women that I met on that journey. And so look for, uh, spaces, um, Eventbrite's just a great place to start. Even in this virtual world, you can still see other um, events. We actually don't run them anymore, or I, or I would invite you to come. I mean, potentially we should start again. But spending time amongst other women who feel the same thing is, I think, the best way to continue to feel like you're heard, you're valued, you're definitely not dumb. Um, at all. And your question about legal personhood um, is definitely a possibility, but it's not something I advocate for. Um, I no, don't think that no. uh, AI should be legal persons. Okay. Keep up the good fight. Yeah, I, I will. You're, you're a big inspiration. Thank you. So are you. You're a big inspiration to me. Turning on your video camera in this forum is a good thing to do. <laughs> Thank you. Morale, can, I, can, I ask, can I ask a follow-up question to Morale quickly, which is, mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for your question and, and for bravely asking it. I wonder, you know, I think many people find it, it challenging to, to engage and get involved. And I just wonder, as we've moved to, to a lot more virtual events, has it, do you think it's easier to do this remotely or is it harder? No, it's harder. It's mm. much harder. Because when you're surrounded by people, you could see... Um, yeah. Uh, you could uh, communicate live with them and that eases uh, the situation. But here I am sitting uh, in Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, mm. in, a, in a room completely alone. And all yeah. of this is happening in, somewhere else. And it's, um, I guess it's, it's easier to connect with people um, from abroad now that mm. every, all the events became virtual. It's much easier. But at the same time, I think it's um, very mentally straining uh to um it's very isolating as well to yeah 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 i think we could find some women in, in ai um in azerbaijan using my twitter will you will you tweet at me and we'll have a look together for who we can find yeah well i already know women in in, in ai in azerbaijan good um, but it's it's just like you know what i was curious about was mainly the you know this um, not to feel like an imposter you know yeah. in in this field because you, you know like i i talk to i talk to men in this field a lot and it's um you just feel it you know they constantly yeah. test you it's yeah. it's like a it's it's like a you know this this bias uh, of you know if you're a girl you have to prove that you know i mean i know that my knowledge level is maybe above yeah. average um in certain well areas average, that i'm confident sure. about about only the ones that I'm confident about, but just in general, it is sometimes such a um, hassle to, you know, you, it, it's kind of, sometimes it's half the work on having to, you know, prove that um, your knowledge is credible. It, it, it is yeah. a bit hard. 
I honestly, what you're saying now is exactly why so the the, the ecosystem has to change. Um, yeah. You you're you're now officially an inspiration to me. I'll remember this forever. Thank you. Um, Thank fantastic. You. That, that, that's a wonderful way and wonderful note that I'm afraid we're going to have to start to wrap up here. Um, I know we've got lots more great questions and the next one up was going to be about explainability, which is close to my heart, but I don't think uh, we're going to be able to get into that now. Please uh, feel free to send questions um, by Twitter or, or to Tabitha or to me if you'd like. And um, we, uh, we are going to have to, to, to wrap up, I'm afraid. Before we say our, our final goodbyes, please note that you'll be able to catch Tabitha again towards the end of this month at our two-day virtual showcase, The Turing Presents AI UK, which will be on the 23rd and 24th of March. Tickets are selling out fast, so please register now. And if you're a student, um, we're offering special rates. Here's, yeah, here, here's, here you can see some, some, uh, some notes on it. Please don't miss out. Um, if you'd like to hear about our events in general, uh, please join our mailing list by heading to turing.ac.uk slash subscribe. And finally, thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you for your great questions. Um, thanks to the Turing Events team. And most of all, big thank you to Tabitha Goldstorp for joining us and making today's event so wonderful. Um, you can find signed copies of her wonderful book, How to Talk to Robots, at dauntbooks.co.uk. Thanks so much and bye-bye. Thank you all, bye. <laughs>